Uh, Dan, you can start anytime. Okay, thanks very much. Welcome everyone uh, to uh, this Carson International Miller Thompson uh, webinar, Zoom call. Uh, what's new in the new NAFTA? Uh, this is a second in a series of uh, presentations on hot topics uh, in international trade and customs uh, on issues that are affecting the international trade community. Over on to the next slide, please, Alfie. Hmm. Okay, we're going to have a little momentary pause here. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, since uh, this is in part a presentation by a law firm, uh, we have to give you a legal disclaimer uh, that uh, none of this information is uh, legal advice. If you need legal advice, please uh, reach out to a qualified uh, lawyer or uh, uh, qualified lawyer practices in customs and trade law. On to the next uh, slide, please. Uh, with us, of course, is uh, one of the uh, preeminent customs brokers in uh, the uh, province, if not the country, uh, Dave Pentland. Uh, Dave has got a wealth of experience in dealing with a variety of issues in uh, customs and international trade uh, and uh, with respect to various industries uh, ranging from food products to uh, retail. Uh, over to the next slide, please. And myself, uh, Dan Kisselback, I'm a leader in the international trade and customs practice in Miller Thompson, which is a national law firm with about 500 lawyers and 13 offices across the country. So without uh, further ado, onto the uh, main event, uh, the uh, uh, COSMA, the Canada-US-Mexico uh, agreement. Um, uh, this is a, um, an agreement that uh, some have referred to as the new NAFTA. And uh, perhaps uh, reflecting the circumstances, uh, the parties couldn't really even agree on what to call this agreement. Uh, Canada calls it the Canada US MCA, uh, the US calls it the US MCA. And uh, what do they call it, Dave, uh, in Mexico? The yeah, TMAC, it's a translado Mexicano, something or other, Canada. Yeah. yeah. They just had to perfect. have their take on it. So. Right. So uh, COSMA, we're going to call it COSMA today because we're in Canada, uh, builds on the uh, NAFTA foundation. Uh, NAFTA, of course, was originally signed into law by President Clinton uh, in uh, 1994, and it created the largest free trade bloc in the world. Many experts agree that uh, it has been an overwhelming uh, success. It has opened up new markets and has acted as a stimulus to build internationally competitive uh, businesses. Uh, the US goods and services trade with Canada, to give you a, a sense of things, uh, totaled uh, 718 billion in 2018. Exports were about uh, 363 billion. Uh, imports were about 354 billion. So the new NAFTA builds on an already successful trade relationship. Over onto the next slide, please. The first thing that we wanted to talk about is uh, agriculture. Uh, dairy uh, exports in particular are a big deal, particularly in the US. Uh, Canada and Mexico are the first and third largest markets for US food and agricultural products, making 28% 20, of uh, US food and agricultural exports in 2017. Uh, and they account for a lot of large uh, number of jobs. So uh, in there, uh, the, uh, there have been a large number of things that have, uh, well, significant things that have uh, happened. And one was the elimination of uh, uh, certain uh, classes of milk. And, and uh, why this happened, uh, we could probably spend some, uh, 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 another presentation on this whole issue. But really what happened was that the, uh, in, in a nutshell, there was a strong demand for butter in Canada. It resulted in Canadian milk production and, and surplus skim milk supplies. Canada started exporting a lot of it to the US and uh, the uh, US uh, dairy uh, producers uh, didn't like it very much. So they asked uh, uh, for some changes with respect to these classes of uh, six and seven um, and, um, and it resulted in, in a certain change. Um, 
the uh, elimination was uh, of these classes was a priority. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's where we are with that particular issue. The other issue is increasing um, uh, dairy market access. Uh, Canada opened up about 3.6% of the dairy market uh, to the US. Uh, when some say, the Canadian producers say that this will carve out a uh, $240 million chunk out of the Canadian dairy industry. Dave, you have any uh, comments? I, I guess the, the TRQ application process uh, has passed now? It's passed. Uh, I, I would just say that if anybody's involved in this sector, it's something that it's uh, you need to do a deep dive into it. It's uh, certainly, uh, it, it's fraught with a little bit of peril and it's certainly on the radar of both uh, CBSA and CBP. So it's, it's something that, uh, um, it, it's probably certainly one of the biggest sectors that's been affected. And so we're, we're doing a little bit of a disservice giving you one slide on, on but it, it's meant to uh, make uh, people aware that this is something that uh, first and foremost, it was on both uh, countries uh, a mandate that this had to be addressed. Uh, otherwise uh, the new agreement wasn't gonna take place. So but yeah. that's pretty much my two comments. So. From, from my perspective, what I see is sometimes the aftermath that people don't get a permit when they should get a permit. And if you don't get a permit when you should get a permit, say you're importing something, you call it a nice treat and it turns out to be ice cream, you can be hit with a 300% duty uh, bill. And uh, that can uh, chalk up quite quickly uh, for importers. Uh, it can add up to a big liability. And then you're in a position where you have to apply for a supplemental retroactive import permit, which may be very difficult to get from uh, Global Affairs Canada. Yeah, one other comment, milk's the same. Milk goes from zero percent to 232 percent so it's uh yeah so either you got to get the 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 uh the tariff uh, rate quota your allocation or uh or you don't import it really because if you don't have the permit they, they, you got this uh, punitive rate of duty over on to the next one uh, auto sector that's another big area that uh, was a change uh, for uh the uh cosma uh the rules of origin have been changed significantly um the uh, CUSMA encourages uh, North American manufacturing and regional economic growth by requiring that 75% of the auto content be made in uh, North America. And then there are trade rules that drive higher wages by requiring that, uh, I guess, 45%, uh, 40 to 45% of the auto content be made by workers uh, have to be earning uh, at least $16 an hour. So it's important, I think, to have um, a, a careful eye on this if you're in the auto parts and auto industry uh, to make sure that uh, you reevaluate, reassess to ensure that the, um, the goods are uh, CUSMA eligible. Just because they're NAFTA eligible doesn't mean they're CUSMA eligible. Over to you, Dave. Thoughts? Um, I, I would say the, the biggest uh, question we're getting is that uh, this involves uh, um, um, OEM. So this is, these are actually people that are producing uh, automobiles. It, it does not get into the aftermarket issue. So uh, we've got a lot of people that are involved in the aftermarket uh, of automotive parts. And, and those, those parts aren't as stringent when, when they're not building the, the vehicle. But certainly there's a lot of people now that are look, looking to build parts and make them Kusuma qualifying so that they can uh, be, uh, take part in the 75% uh, uh, because that was a huge uh, jump from, you know, it's 12 and a half percent increase on parts that are deemed that they have to be uh, uh, Kusma qualifying to go into an automobile that can be then uh, said to be uh, Kusma uh, qualifying the entire automobile. So. Okay, on to the next one. Uh, I believe it's de minimis. Oh, oh wait, we've... Uh... Got a little bit more here. Oh, there was a comment here, Dave. I guess uh, Canada secured an exemption from potential 232 measures in the side letter agreement. Uh, this is in, uh, important uh, given the fact that uh, President Trump is, uh, has, a, has a tendency to sometimes uh, sign executive orders in increasing uh, uh, you know, the tariffs under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. Yeah, I, I guess one word of caution is that uh, with a stroke of the pen, he can actually uh, um, change this at any time. So there, there's still a lot of concern that uh, he may um, do something if, uh, you know, 
if the um, the lights not shiny is uh, is correct way and is uh, Mira Largo uh, Resort. So I, I, I'd say that this is one you got to stay current on and, and watch the certainly the um, the trade publications. So. Yeah. Yeah, the president has uh, powers under, I don't know, five or six different acts in the U.S. Uh, to uh, increase tariffs, and uh, he has uh, had a tendency to exercise that power from time to time. Over on to the next uh, uh, page, please. Textile and apparel. Well, uh, so uh, Dave, why don't you take a shot at that one there? Uh, the, the yeah, rules so of the so textile apparel is uh, an, another sector that's uh, that's actually changed quite a bit. And, um, uh, and let me just uh, bring up my notes here. Sorry, multiple yeah, screens. So, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the Kusma countries, uh, there's um, there's a lot of um, products that don't strictly qualify under the Kusma. For example, the, the same way they didn't qualify under NAFTA. So you've got cases where you can't use offshore fabric to produce garments within a, uh, one of the Kusma countries. And so th to address this, uh, Canada was, was adamant and, uh, and they're the ones that stepped up and with the help of Global Affairs Canada, uh, they require, uh, you can actually apply for permits to get access to quota as long as the uh, manufacturing of the garments is done within a Kusma country. And so in, in those cases, uh, they, uh, they've addressed that. And in some cases, they've increased the quota uh, the numbers uh, coming in or going into the United States. In some cases, they've reduced them, but in those categories, they've reduced them uh, to uh, uh, where the, the quota was not being used fully. So it, it, this is something that we should be proud as Canadians that uh, Canada was was pushing for this because uh, there was some rumors they were going to abolish the entire uh, process and that would have created a havoc and increased prices for clothing uh, for um, uh, persons in Canada, the United States and Mexico. So, so bottom line, the rules have uh, been adjusted again uh, under the uh, new NAFTA. Yeah. On to the next uh, slide, please. Here we go, de minimis. So uh, uh, the de minimis, uh, these are the rules uh, that allow uh, duty-free entry in certain circumstances into certain countries. Canada has set limits at uh, $150 for customs duties and uh, uh, $40 for taxes. Um, so uh, this, uh, there is um, a uh, customs notice 2018 dated May the 2nd, 2020, uh, that outlines these changes. And it really relates to a courier imports remission order, right? Correct. So, uh, so it, it, in the United States, the de minimis levels are actually quite higher, and that has uh, created a cottage industry in Canada, I believe, right? Yeah. So I would. Uh, so de minimis in the United States is is currently set at eight hundred U.S. dollars. And de minimis applies uh, for the same process that if an American came into Canada and did personal shopping, every single day he can come up, spend, or he or she can come up, spend 800 US dollars and go back in the United States. That is extended to companies shipping goods from uh, anywhere in the world into the United States. Now, uh, the United States lobbied to have Canada increase our de minimis level, which was used to be $20 before Kusma. Um, and the retail council in Canada fought fiercely because this would, uh, they said, would wipe out uh, any sense of e-com um, orders in Canada. And so uh, it was decided that they would allow $40 for duty and taxes exempt into Canada and $150 uh, on uh, customs duties, uh, not for duty and tax. Now, the, the, uh, I guess a word of note is that this applies regardless of the country of origin. As long as the goods have entered in the commerce of Mexico or the United States, they can come into Canada uh, under $150 exempt from duties. So, um, you know, there's a bit of a break for the home consumer buying goods that are they're coming up. Um, but certainly it, it's nowhere near the $800 level. And, and I think they'll, they will fight that uh, tooth and nail in, in Canada. Yeah, and so as a result of this, uh, there have been developments of strategies to take advantage of the de minimis uh, levels uh, 
uh, for example, importing goods into Canada into a hub and then for e-commerce having uh, the e-commerce e uh, customers ordering onesies, twosies under the $800 level into the United States duty free. And um, that um, has, uh, uh, has uh, been uh, watched uh, by the uh, U U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer who has uh, testified in the U.S. Um, House uh, Ways and Means Committee and the U.S. Senate Finance Committee about this being a loss to the U.S. Uh, commerce and possibly they may drop the de minimis level down again. Yeah, there's there's talk that they may drop it down to five hundred dollars U.S. But I, I still think that that would still, you know, suit many e-com companies. And, and and a shameless plug to Dan and I, uh, in the future we're going to do a session with a. Uh, a 3PL that's actually doing a lot of U.S. e-commerce out of Canada into the United States. And, there, and there's some real benefits to companies to do that and access. And so it's like Dan said, it's become a, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than a cottage industry. It's become a full-blown big industry where companies now are looking at bringing U.S. e-com goods into Canada, not paying any U.S. duties, and then exporting them in the United States under de minimis rules. So yeah, you can um, save millions of dollars this way. So yes. yeah. On to the uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so this is the low value shipment uh, uh, level. Uh, that uh, this this level has been increased to three hundred thirty uh, three thousand three hundred dollars, uh, and the LVS program is designed to allow for simplified reporting, release, and accounting for goods, uh, and and so this is a benefit. Uh, under the uh, COSMA agreement to uh, low value shipment uh, importers. Any comments, Dave? Um, I would say it, it's just, uh, this was sort of some housekeeping that uh, uh, Canada wanted to get on side with approximately the same rules as the United States. So in the United States, informal entries are up to $2,500. So they kind of took 3,300 to be closely in line with what the uh, low value uh, or informal entries are in the United States. And in the United States, these informal entries, they, they pretty much liquidate, which means they finalize at time of release. And Canada is looking at the same uh, um, uh, process where they're not going to target and, and look closely at it. It doesn't uh, make any sense to spend a lot of time and manpower on shipments that are, are low value and scrutinize importers and exporters. So um, you get simplified reporting, like Dan said, where uh, documentation is, is not necessarily uh, required. You don't need a Kusma certificate at time of release. Um, you, you just need to report certain uh, items, uh, key data elements, and um, the, you know, the couriers were very big on this as well because they uh, they enjoy this program. In in our world, the broker's world, um, this these goods uh, will actually release and are delivered, and the broker is, is not finalized the entry till sometimes the twenty fourth of the next uh, right. the next uh, month. So. Yeah, so you have to pay that all the duties no later than the last business day of the month, but uh, you account for your goods by the 24th of the month. Correct. And uh, so uh, couriers can uh, be a participant in the uh, CLVS program, the Courier Low Value Shipment Program. And there's actually a D memorandum uh, 1740 that deals with this. On to the next slide. Government procurement, I'm, I'm not too sure that this will have too much of an impact uh, with respect to uh, this audience, but uh, just to note that there have been uh, changes to the government procurement uh, rules. Uh, this pertains to the ability of, of, of uh, contractors, uh, businesses who want to uh, take advantage of the ability to sell goods to governments. And uh, there are thresholds uh, uh, that um, that are, apply to these types of contracts and indicate when when you uh, can fall within the protections of a free trade agreement. Uh, Canada has um, has indicated in a notice. There's a Treasury Board Secretariat uh, for the Government of Canada has published a new contracting policy notice 2020 uh, titled "Replacement of the North American Free Trade Agreement." Um, and it indicates that Canada will maintain government procurement commitments under the World Trade Organization uh, and uh, with, with the U.S. Uh, so WTO uh, agreement uh, procurement levels 
uh, pertaining to the U.S. And uh, with Re Mexico, the levels are found in the uh, CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's a bit of a mouthful. Over on to the next slide, please. Intellectual property. Well, this is a bit of a bugbear for the U.S. in particular. Uh, you see that in this slide, there, there are uh, certain protections that have been extended uh, under the policy framework, uh, such as requiring per, uh, parties to provide uh, general copyright protective for life plus 70 years for works of authorship and so forth. Uh, and it also requires uh, parties to provide uh, patent uh, term adjustments to uh, deal with uh, patent applicants uh, for unreasonable delays and so forth. Uh, one of the biggest things that I uh, recall, uh, I remember uh, speaking to the uh, former U.S. ambassador about this, was the ability of uh, some folks to um, uh, allegedly import uh, goods that infringed uh, copyright and they would use Canada as a transshipment point. And Canada took the position that they were not entitled to seize and detain and, and forfeit uh, goods that are said to uh, be infringing intellectual property rights. Uh, now, uh, uh, for the first time, the USTR says uh, that this agreement under COSMA allows for what they call ex officio authority for law enforcement officials to stop suspected uh, counterfeit or pirated goods at every phase of entering, exiting, and transiting through the territory of any party. So that's a big deal because previously the way the law read, uh, Canada didn't have uh, the ability to go and, and, and do anything for and on behalf of a trade party. Now, um, supposedly, according to the USTR uh, policy, the agreement does that. So I haven't really traced through all these provisions, but that's what um, it is said to uh, provide for. Uh, it happens, you know, not that often, but from time to time, you'll get maybe, say, a ship of Hello Kitty goods coming in, and uh, they'll say, uh, we think that this is all counterfeit, and then the CBSA uh, may uh, go in and, and uh, do a, uh, you know, a cargo inspection and uh, determine whether or not the goods are infringing uh, our gray market goods. Uh, so uh, certification, this is a big uh, deal, Dave. Yeah, so certification, it, there's a major change, uh, and the biggest change being is that uh, under NAFTA since 1994, there has been a prescribed NAFTA certificate of origin. And so, um, like other agreements that Canada's got involved in, uh, they've decided that uh, rather than uh, certificate of origins designed specifically for trade agreements, that they would take uh, the Kuzma as a, a, and try and modernize it so that only data elements that would allow certification are required. And so there's minimum data elements that are required, but there is no form. So uh, the, the data elements are, are fairly, there's nine key data elements. Um, we've actually looked at this early on and, and, and we've, um, we sought out some uh, advice from both CBSA, CBP, and the uh, learned lawyer on the line with me today, Dan, that uh, could Carson actually develop their own certificate because often it's easier to tell people to fill out boxes on a form than it is to fill out data elements on a blank piece of paper. So we actually produced a, uh, a certificate. We have not uh, copyrighted it, we're not protecting it. And so we, uh, it's free to use, it's based on our website. Uh, there's an example coming up here. If anybody wants a copy, they can drop me an email, we'll send it to you. And we've had a number of our clients that thank you very much. They just take our logo off it, put their logo on it. We don't have a problem with that. It's just, it just makes nice little boxes to fill in instead of uh, daily elements onto a, um, a letter. So, um, and again, certification can be done as, as was under NAFTA, either on a shipment by shipment basis or on an annual basis. And uh, I know our firm and uh, other brokers have been advising their customers to uh, maybe suggest uh, going from July 1st, uh, 2020 till December 3rd, 30th, uh, 31st, 2020, and then next year making a year just it'll make everybody's lives easier than trying to go half year to the half year next year. So um, another big change is that we finally entered the era where 
the customs authorities will allow you to submit electronically cert certification and also accept electronic uh, or digital signatures. So that's a, that's another big change. So. It, it, it is now the case that the importer, exporter, and producer can certify. Yes, that's right. So that, that's a change from the, uh, the previous regime. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier. You can come up with your own form and the importer can uh, cert, uh, issue a certification. Yeah, and the, the rationale for that was there's a lot of companies that have a brain trust in one country that actually has all the knowledge, the information. And um, you know, unfortunately, the way that DAFTA was is that you had to be the shipper, the exporter to sign the certificate. And sometimes those people signing it had no knowledge whatsoever about the certification. So the thought was, if there's a party that's either the consignee in Canada or the United States or Mexico, or the shipper, or the exporter, any one of those three parties can make up the certification as long as they have the information uh, that uh, that uh, verifies that the goods qualify under Kuzma. So that's the rationale. Very good. I see we've got five minutes left, so we'll have to run through the next ones. Uh, certification data elements, we talked about that. Don't forget one, I guess, is the big deal. You've got to put them all in there. Otherwise, you're going to have a fail rather than a pass, right? Yeah, and rather go into anything, nothing's really changed on there other than um, an origin criteria. If you look at it, it's pretty much the, the same as it was under NAFTA. Um, so it, it's, um, and like I said, it's, uh, the, there's uh, lots of information online and certainly you could follow up with either Dan or myself if you need to. So. Yeah, and, and use the handy dandy uh, Customs International uh, certification form. Okay, the next uh, slide, please. There it is in the flesh. Uh, yeah, this, that, that's uh, that's also serves as an eye chart for anybody online. So. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. On to the next one, please. Claims and record keeping. Well, that's similar, right? Uh, four years from the date of import. Uh, no change for the U.S., which is one year from the date of import from Mexico. Um, uh, importer claiming preferential tariff treatment uh, must maintain uh, uh, the records for no less than five years from the date of importation. Uh, so, so similar uh, requirements, right? Yeah, I'd say the only big change is Canada's gone from one year from uh, claiming uh, NAFTA, and now it's opened up to four years. So that's that's the one big change under uh, claims. So. Right. Yeah. So it's a favorable uh, outcome from the importer's perspective. On to the next slide. Customs verification, something near and dear to my heart. Uh, we often see uh, a new um, group of individuals or businesses that uh, get caught in verifications every year. And um, it, with respect to the uh, COSMA, uh, it is my uh, view that uh, the uh, governments of uh, both sides of the border and probably Mexico will uh, consider uh, origin and tariff uh, treatment to be a verification priority in the next uh, while. I remember in the days of uh, the introduction of NAFTA, there was a suggestion that up to 50% of the certificates of origin uh, in that case were not correct. And so uh, the CBSA spent some time um, verifying uh, NAFTA certificates. And again, in this case, uh, it's, it's probably um, reasonable to believe that, uh, especially going forward in the next year, COSMA will be on the hot uh, topics uh, uh, list for uh, uh, CBP and C CBSA. David? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think it's one of those, it's a slippery slope where um, customs in Canada, uh, I'm talking about, will go give you four years to file claims. Um, you want to make sure that you really understand that your goods qualify under CUSMA because um, it, it, it's, uh, you're just building up a liability. So if they don't look at your particular imports for three years from the date of uh, CUSMA applying, they can go back three years and and, uh, and uh, I would think the larger you are as an importer or exporter, the more you're at risk to make sure that, uh, you know, you've got your ducks in a row if somebody's certifying those goods. Um, it, it's lying in wait and it's just a matter of time. Uh, so it's, uh, it's beholden upon um, companies to make sure that they kind of 
you know, dive in. And, and I would say 90% of uh, Kusma, uh, the rules of origin haven't changed. The other 10% are going to trip up some people. So, um, right. so over on to the next slide. Uh, just to say that uh, I think the purpose of this is that there are lots of tools in the tool belt for the uh, government authorities to go and get documents, request documents, go do site visits, uh, do all the friendly things that they've been doing in the past. And so the uh, COSMA um, uh, agreement and the uniform regulations provide uh, for the manner and form of getting information and verifying uh, information on the part of government authorities, including the CBSA. Yeah, and I'd say my only one comment would be is that there's there's more language in Kusma for uh, the for customs on both sides of the border to uh, work with each other, so the, you may see a little bit more cooperation and more of a concerted effort by parties to um, not necessarily wait for U.S. Customs to come up and visit you on Canadian soil. You may have Canada Customs drop in because they're a little easier to get at. So. Right. On to the next slide, please. Dispute resolution, I won't uh, go into the details here, uh, it, just to say that uh, it is less robust than it was before. Uh, and uh, so uh, there is a dispute resolution process, but for the purposes of this particular presentation, it's probably not uh, critical that we delve into it. On to the next one, please. Well, uh, with that, I guess what uh, I would like to say is that there are certain takeaways uh, the USMCA has, uh, you know, created uh, some uh, differences uh, and uh, there have been some changes. I would say that uh, from my perspective, the, the big takeaways are find out how it impacts your business. Uh, you know, discuss it with David, uh, see what, uh, what uh, the uh, impacts may be for your particular business, because many businesses are very distinct. Uh, verification is a real poss possibility, especially when uh, folks are, are claiming preferential tariff treatment and it's duty-free treatment. The governments uh, will want to go and uh, verify that those are correct. And don't assume that because it was okay under NAFTA, it's okay under COSMA because uh, the advice that uh, the uh, CBP and, and CBSA have been setting out in their uh, guidance uh, documents is that you can't rely on former uh, NAFTA rulings, for example. You have to go and get a new ruling. You should be doing your determination due diligence at this point in time. David? Yeah, I just echo exactly the same uh, comments. Um, just do your homework, uh, find out. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of issues that you can just take a look at the rules of origin. If they're identical to NAFTA and you're still producing the product in the same way or your, or your vendor is, then there's no issues. You kind of move on. If there has been some changes, then really dig in and understand them and, and requalify your goods. And um, yeah, if you have issues, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's time to, what's your old adage, Dan, you know, about customs calling on the door? Uh, yeah, I, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You don't want to, yeah. you can't rely upon the kindness of strangers, right? That's yeah. not a good strategy. Yeah, so, but uh, um that's uh, that. pretty much all I've got to say. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, it was enjoyable 30 minutes. I'm glad we got it done in 32 minutes. Um, and I guess, Dan, there's another session that we're going to put on. Uh, Dan's got some uh, insightful tips for non-resident importers. It's not for everybody, but uh, non-resident importers sort of tips and traps on August 20th. And then uh, we're going to talk about risk mi uh, minimization strategies on uh, September 3rd. So if you're... Yeah. Um, there'll be signups available. So. Yeah, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, please uh, contact us if you have any questions. Uh, we look forward to uh, providing another one uh, at another date. Uh, and uh, with that, we want to wish you a good day. All right, take care, stay safe.